Now you're probably wondering if I'm going to comment on the uh, go-kart races as we get started here. Just one little note, the reason I almost got hit is because I was in front. <laughs> well, we've been talking over the last couple of weeks about Jesus' final trip to Jerusalem. This is where he's going up and he's going to give his life as a ransom for the sins of humanity so that we can have a right relationship with God. And as we come to chapter 21, we've come to what's called the triumphal entry. And this is where Jesus comes riding in from the Mount of Olives to the city of Jerusalem. And he's presented as the king to Israel. And up until this point, he had largely been in the background, if you will. In other words, when a great healing would take place or something, you tell the people, don't tell anyone about it. But here, it's public. He's being presented as the king to fulfill prophecy that he would come to his own. And so that's what we have here in Matthew chapter 21. So uh, diving right in, Matthew 21, verse 1, it says, Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. All this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So it tells us here in verse 1, when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, they would be coming from the east. This is looking at Jerusalem from the south. So they would be coming from the east, from Jericho up to Jerusalem. Bethany is about two miles outside of Jerusalem Bethphage is about one mile, so somewhere between Bethany and the Temple Mount, where the temple stood, is Bethphage, on the Mount of Olives. And Jesus is coming there because he's going to be riding from the Mount of Olives and coming in triumphantly into the city of Jerusalem. And he sends two of his disciples, and he tells them to, to go get a donkey, a, a donkey's colt to ride in. And as we see here, it's to fulfill, as Matthew tells us, it's to fulfill the prophecy that is in Zechariah 9.9 that says your king is coming to you. This was 500 years earlier. So the king has been prophesied and now the king has arrived and he is coming in to the city. And notice that it says that he's coming in lowly and sitting on a donkey. And, and you wouldn't necessarily think that's how a king would come, would you? Uh, oftentimes, especially in that day, you think a king would be coming on on a horse in, in majesty, and, and they did. They rode horses, they rode war horses. But in times of peace, we see examples where they would be riding on a donkey. In uh, Solomon's case, when he was coronated as the king after his father David, he was placed on his father David's mule and brought in. So a similar type of thing, and it, and it signifies that this isn't a time of war. It's a time of peace, and that's significant. Because when Jesus came, he came to bring peace between a lost, sinful humanity and a holy God. And so we see him here as the Prince of Peace, if you will, to bring us to God. When he was in the synagogue in Nazareth, Luke chapter 4, he was handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and he turned to what would become Isaiah 61. They didn't have chapter and verse divisions at that time. He opened the scroll to Isaiah 61, and he read this, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And at that point, he closed the scroll, and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened upon him, and he said, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And of course, subsequently, they wanted to kill him because they thought it was blasphemy, because they knew that this could only apply to the Messiah, the anointed of God, who would come to open the prison doors. But what I see as significant here is notice where he stopped. 
he stopped in saying, I'm here to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. This is the time where you can get your life right with God. And he stopped prior to saying the day of vengeance of our God. At his first coming, and again, interestingly enough, when he came riding on a colt, he came as the Prince of Peace to make a relationship for humanity available to God. And uh, when he comes the second time, though, Revelation 19 tells us that he's riding on a horse. And it's that time he comes as a man of war, proclaiming, if you will, the day of vengeance of God, where judgment will fall on a Christ rejecting humanity. So Jesus has come. He has come to bring peace to a lost humanity. The king predicted 500 years earlier, the king has come here in Matthew 21. And how many know that the king is coming again? Amen. He's going to return and we look forward to his coming. So now is the day, today is the day to have your life right with the Lord. And so the disciples, verse 6, went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. In Matthew's gospel, he repeatedly has these passages that we find in the Old Testament. He said when Jesus came in uh, riding on a donkey, he was fulfilling Zechariah 9.9. Now he makes a point of letting his readers know that the crowds are crying out another messianic passage. And, and I'm probably pretty sure that in your Bible, when it comes to verse 9, it, it's offset, it's indented from the margin, and that's to show us that it's an Old Testament passage. It's an Old Testament prophecy, or at the very least, inferring back to a passage and implying that this is what is being referred to. Hosanna to the son of David. This is Psalm 118. Now, the word Hosanna came to me in an exclamation of praise, and I, we have four songs in our in our drawer back here that we can pull from that are called Hosanna. You know, all four of them are different. And so we sing that, don't we? Hosanna in the highest. And what we're, what we're singing is, is like, praise you, Lord. We're, we're lifting up our hearts in praise to you. But the literal meaning of the word Hosanna is save, we pray. And so when you go back to Psalm 118, you don't see the word in our English translation as Hosanna, but you see it say this, Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26, Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. So it's what's called the transliteration. The Hebrew word for save is yasha, and the Hebrew word for pray is na. So yasha na, or it would come across as hosanna. And so what are they crying is here, the Prince of Peace is coming to make peace between a lost humanity and a holy God. They're crying out, save us now, we pray. And that's what he came to do. He came to save us. He came to save a lost humanity. Well, at this point, the religious leaders are kind of up in arms. You know, the triumphal entry is recorded in all four of the gospels. It's in Luke's gospel that the Pharisees say, teacher, tell your disciples to be quiet because they see it as blasphemy. They know that Psalm 118 is a messianic psalm and it could only be attributed to the Messiah, the anointed of God who would come in to set his people free. And do you remember what Jesus said when the Pharisees said, tell your, tell your disciples to be quiet? Do you remember? Yeah. What was it? <laughs> the stones. Let's turn over there. Luke chapter 19. The stones are going to cry out if these guys are quiet. And wouldn't it have been kind of neat if, if they did keep quiet just to see what would happen at that time? And the stones themselves cried out, Hosanna to the son of David. And so we see in Luke chapter 19, we'll just take it up from verse 39. This is after the crowds have said, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Luke 19:39. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. You see, this is the day that the Lord has made. And that's what it says back in Psalm 118. 
This is the day that Jesus would be revealed as the king to all of Israel. Remember, so many times he said, my hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. Well, here we've come to the time where he's being revealed to the nation of Israel. We refer to this as well as Palm Sunday, don't we? Because the multitudes, they're, they're waving branches, they're placing their clothes in the road, and it's John's gospel that tells us that they're palm branches that, that they're waving. And so that's why we refer to it as Palm Sunday. But let's read on in verse 41. It says, now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. And this is kind of interesting, isn't it? He's coming in this triumphal procession being acknowledged as the king of Israel, but as he looks across, and again, he's... On the Mount of Olives, he's got a commanding view at this point of the Temple Mount where the temple once stood. Now, this is a, a shot from the Mount of Olives looking across the Kidron Valley and over to the Temple Mount where today the Muslim mosque, the Dome of the Rock sits. And if you see in the foreground, you can see the Eastern Gate that's right there. Now, it's believed that the the temple would have sat directly across from the Eastern Gate. So with, with the help of Photoshop, we can kind of just figure what it maybe looked like <laughs> in those days as Jesus looked across, you know, minus the skyscrapers in the background, you can get an idea of what it would have looked like as he looked across, yet he, he wept. He wept because he knew what was gonna come. I believe he could look some 38 years into the future and see that the Roman legions would come and they would surround the city. And there would be great carnage at that time because they didn't recognize. They didn't recognize Jesus. And so they had missed it and judgment would end up falling. And let's read on again, verse 41. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known, even you especially in this your day, notice this, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. And as we read in Josephus, the first century historian, in his book, The War of the Jews, you can read uh, from a person who was there, an account of the atrocities that were taking place, the starvation that was happening within the city because the Romans had surrounded it and they were held out for so long within the city. And then they fought, the Jews fought and they fought hard, but, but they couldn't stand against Rome. And it was really ultimately, it was the judgment of God that was coming at this time. Interestingly enough, Josephus makes the point that the temple was destroyed, the city fell on the exact same day of the year that Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Solomon's temple at the, at the Babylonian time. And that's interesting, isn't it? But the temple itself set fire by the Roman soldiers and of course made of stone, but so much silver, so much gold that is part of that temple. And as we all know, the temple is not there today. It is gone, and, and it brings, you know, to vivid uh, reminder of Jesus' prediction here that there wouldn't be one stone left upon another. In fact, an interesting thing, when you look at the other side of the Temple Mount, the Temple Mount is so-called because it, Jerusalem is on a hill. It's on Mount Moriah, and you've got a retaining wall where they've filled it in so that you could have this large platform that the temple was built on. On the other side, we're looking from the east. On the other side, you have the western retaining wall, or what is referred to as the wailing wall, or the western wall where the Jews will go and they will pray to this day. Just to what would it be the southern side of that, there's excavated the what's called the Tyropian Valley, and you can see the floor that's been excavated, and you can see how the, the pavement stones have been crushed in. And it's speculation, but it's believed that the stones of the temple were pushed off of the Temple Mount as they're digging the gold and the silver out from between the stones as the fire melted it there. And again, it brings to vivid reminder what Jesus said, there wouldn't be one stone left upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. You missed the Prince of Peace and so judgment would fall. There's a truth in that for all of us as well. If we miss the Prince of Peace, one day there's going to be a time of judgment 
that will fall upon us. And Jesus is the only way that we can have our lives right with God. He's the only way that our sin can be forgiven. And so it's just crucial for us to cry out to Jesus to save us from our sin and to enter into that relationship with God. Notice that Jesus was really kind of specific because you did not know the time of your visitation. It's almost like he's implying they should have known. And I think, you know, when you look at the prophecies, there's over 300 prophecies of the first coming of Jesus. And if I remember correctly, there's about 60 specific prophecies and then 200 and some details that go along with those major prophecies of his coming. And so Zechariah and David in Psalm 118 saying he's coming. But really what, what the clincher, I think, is, is in Daniel chapter 9, you have the prophecy of the 70 weeks of Daniel, which is a mathematical prophecy that pinpoints when Jesus, when the Messiah would actually come. How about that? And according to Sir Robert Anderson's book, The Coming Prince, they could have known to the exact day when their king would come to them. How about that? Riding in on this donkey into the city of Jerusalem and being... Uh, acknowledged as the king. Really the key though is that their hearts weren't in the right spot. They weren't in the right spot to acknowledge their God, Jesus, God incarnate, God in human flesh that has come to them to reach out to them. And so they turned on him and they end up delivering him up to be crucified. And so back here in Matthew again, uh, chapter 21, the multitudes, they're crying out, Hosanna, save us now to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Verse 10, and when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved saying, who is this? So the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Verse 12, then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Now, when it says that Jesus in verse 12 went into the temple, the idea would be the temple courts. This is a model of, actually a model of the city of Jerusalem in the first century. You can see the park benches in the, in the background there. You get an idea what the, the size of it is. If you've ever been to Legoland, they've got little Lego models of, of uh, you know, Washington and, and New York. And, and it's the same type of an idea. And it's kind of neat because you can see what the city of Jerusalem looked like in the first century. And this is at the Holy Land Hotel in Jerusalem. And we're looking from the west we're looking eastward at the back of the temple and you can see again the large temple mount the retaining walls and and how it's built up and the courtyards are the places on on either side this would be referred to as as the outer court or the courts of the gentiles okay the non-jewish people they could come into that place and they could worship god there but they couldn't go inside the building Inside the building is the place where the priests would go. And, and inside the temple itself, you would have two rooms. You would have the sanctuary, and then you would have the Holy of Holies. And it was within the Holy of Holies that the Ark of the Covenant once stood. And once the Ten Commandments that God had given to Moses were inside of the Ark of the Covenant. And the Holy of Holies represented the presence of God in a very unique way. And so the Holy of Holies representing here and where God in, his, in the Shekinah glory cloud would, would, would be. And, and the only one who could go in the Holy of Holies was the high priest. And he could only go in one day out of the year on the Day of Atonement where he'd go in with blood for his own sin and blood for the nation of Israel and make atonement on that day. In the sanctuary, the room outside of that, it's where the priests would go and you would have the candlestick and so forth and they would tend to that. And so there, where the priest's duties would take place in that area. And then outside of that, you had the various courtyards and, and you'd have the men of Israel could, could be a little bit closer to the temple. And then the court of the women, the women of Israel could, could be in another courtyard. And then the court of the Gentiles is outside of that. And, and it was showing us that there was kind of like a, a hierarchy on how close you could get to the temple, how close you could get, if you will, to the presence of God. What's it showing us? It's showing us that access into God's presence wasn't easy under the old covenant. Access into God's presence wasn't readily available under the old covenant, but under the new covenant, 
How many of you know that we can come boldly, we can come confidently before the throne of grace? Isn't that cool? We can go behind the veil into God's very presence because of Jesus, because he's made a way into his presence. Well, here in the outer courts, this is where the booths were set up where they were selling, they were selling doves, they were exchanging money, they were sell, selling animals for the sacrifices. And, and what would happen is the worshipers would come on, on the feast day and they would come to be able to offer the animal sacrifices. But if you brought your own animal, one way or another, the priest would find a blemish on it and you wouldn't be, I'm sorry, it's not fit to offer. It has to be without a blemish. But we have these animals over here that you could purchase. A little bit higher rate, mind you, but you could purchase these animals and the money they would bring. You couldn't bring Roman coinage. You'd have to have the Jewish, shek Jewish shekel. So they would exchange it. Of course, the rate is going to be a little bit higher as well to be able to exchange that money. And I, again, I think it's Josephus that wrote that it was the high priest who owned the booths. And the priests were running the booths. And so what was happening here? They were ripping off the people that were coming to worship God, and they were set up there in the court of the Gentiles. So the Gentiles, this is as close as they can get to worship God, and yet it's a marketplace, and this is what made Jesus indignant. This is righteous anger that's taking place here as he drives them out, and as he said, my father's house shall be called a house of prayer. And in the quotation in Isaiah, it's a house of prayer for all the nations not just the Jewish people, but for all of the nations. The Jews and the Gentiles, there, there was such animosity between them. If a Gentile tried to get slip into those other courtyards, he could be put to death. It, there was a wall that surrounded the temple itself. And in 1871, there was a discovery of one of the tablets that was on the wall. And this is what it says, the translation of it. No foreigner... No Gentile may enter within the barricade which surrounds the sanctuary and enclosure. Anyone who is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his ensuing death. And they were so passionate about this, so deep was their feeling that the Romans actually allowed them to put to death anyone who went past that wall, even if they were a Roman citizen. And that's a big deal in that day. And so the animosity that took place between the Jews and the Gentiles was huge. But you see Jesus' heart here. I mean, these are God's people too, and they want to approach God, and this is as close as they can get is the court of the Gentiles. And you guys have turned it into a marketplace, yet it's supposed to be a place of prayer. Isaiah 56, verses 6 and 7. Also, the sons of the foreigner, that's to get the context here. The sons of the foreigner, the sons of the Gentiles, even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, for all of the nations. And then in Jeremiah, but you have made it a den of thieves. And so the coupling of those two prophets together as Jesus points out their sin, the religious leaders' sin, the religious leaders that were, what were they doing? They were ripping off the worshipers of God. And we see the righteous indignation coming from Jesus. How would he feel today? if he turned on Christian television. And do you know that such a good part of Christian television are people who are trying to rip off the people of God. Do you realize that? They're people that are just, they're, they're preying on those that are living off their social security check. So if you just send in your love gift, God is obligated to multiply that. Now, admittedly, there's going to be greed on the part of the person that's, that's sending in their money. Yeah, I, you know, it's like playing the lottery or something. I might win big here. But these guys are supposed to be representing God to the people. And it's a shame because they're the ones that have the money because people are sending their money in. And that's what people see on Christian television. That's the shame about it. You turn on so much of Christian television and you see people that are ripping other people off. And how would Jesus feel about that? I think there'd be a righteous indignation that would come forth. Let me take it a step further beyond the televangelists or, or the modern day pastor that might be ripping off the people. How about us who are called by his name, who are called Christians? Sometimes for people who, who don't come to church, we're the only Bible they'll ever read. When they see our lives, how we represent what a Christian is supposed to be. Well, you can, can you see the, the importance of that and, and the responsibility that we have to live 
uprightly, not just the things we say, but the things that we do all during the week when people are watching us. See, we can be attractive, can't we? We can, we can make Christianity attractive for people who don't know the Lord, or we can totally turn them off. We can just reinforce their feeling of the whole reason I don't go to church is because there's a bunch of hypocrites in the church. Well, it's true, you know, and it's true, I think, maybe with all of us. We're all probably hypocritical at one time or another. But can you see how important it is for us to live the life, to live the life so that we can be a magnet for people to come to know the Lord? And, and I, I think it pleases the Lord when we do that. I think it, it makes him happy when he sees us shining brightly for him so that others, others might, be, might be brought in. And so here Jesus goes and he, with righteous indignation, drives those out that are buying and selling. But notice verse 14, then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. The needy, he took care of them. The religious leaders are the ones he's upset with, but the needy, the blind and the lame, his compassion for them. Verse 15, but when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant and said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise, Psalm 8. So we have a lot of scripture in this passage. So we have a lot of Old Testament scripture that Matthew is bringing in to show us who Jesus is. And, and it's, isn't it ironic, the religious leaders are upset with Jesus because the children are recognizing who Jesus is. Sometimes children can be a real barometer, can't they? You know, if, they, if they're really, you know, sketchy about somebody, you, know, you ought to take note of that and go, hmm, I wonder what's wrong with this person. The children loved Jesus, didn't they? Because I think they knew who Jesus was. They could tell that he, he was someone special and Jesus loves the little children. And so here, out of the mouth of babes and nurse, nursing infants, you have perfected praise. Verse 17, then he left them and went out of the city to Bethany and he lodged there. So he, he's coming out of the city now at this time and he's coming into uh, Bethany, which by the way, Bethany, as I mentioned, was two miles outside of Jerusalem. It's where Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus lived and oftentimes that's where he would stay when he was in Judea up in the area of Jerusalem, so two miles out of it. Verse 18, now in the morning, as he returned to the city, so he's come into the Temple Mount, he's gone out and lodged in Bethany, and now he's coming back and returning again. In the morning, as he returned to the city, he was hungry, and seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves, and said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again, immediately the fig tree withered away. Now, does this sound like Jesus to you? <laughs> At first we read it and go, something doesn't seem right here. You know, he doesn't seem like the one that would, ah, I'm hungry, ah, no fruit on you, ah, curse you and withers away. It just doesn't <laughs> seem like him until you recognize what the fig tree symbolizes. In the Old Testament, we talked about this, I think last week or, or the week before, how the vineyard in the Old Testament would represent the nation of Israel, Isaiah chapter 5, where it talks about the vineyard of the Lord of hosts, the, the house of Israel and the house of Judah. The fig tree, same thing. You see it not only in the Old Testament, but you also see it in the New Testament, where the fig tree represents the, the nation of Israel. As an example in Hosea, uh, one of, of, of a number of examples, Hosea 9.10 says, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first fruits on the fig tree in its first season, but they went to Baal Peor and separated themselves to that shame. They became an abomination like the thing they loved. And so why the illustration of the fig tree? Well, because fruit, figs, come off of a fig tree. And that's what God was looking for. He was looking for fruit from the nation of Israel. He was looking for righteousness. He was looking for obedience, faithfulness. But what he found was a nation that was turning to Baal turning away from God and turning to worship false gods. And so when we look at this story here, I think if we take the fig tree as not just a fig tree that didn't have any food on it, but a representation of the nation of Israel, read that as the religious leaders that are not being obedient to God. We just are reading about how they're all upset at Jesus and they're ripping off the people of God. It makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? They're not bearing the kind of fruit of righteousness that God wants to see in their lives. And because of that, 
because of that, judgment is going to fall. And just like we spoke earlier that the Romans are going to end up coming in and destroying the city and the sanctuary, that will take place. He's looking for fruit in their lives. As we finish the chapter next week, we're going to see that he's looking for fruit in our lives too. And so what kind of fruit is he looking for? Apricots or <laughs> you know, apples? I, I think Galatians 5 just kind of brings it into perspective, doesn't it? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. So what is he looking for in my life? He's not looking for me to be bitter against people or hate this person or I hate that, but he's looking for love. He's looking for joy. And that doesn't mean I don't go through hard times and doesn't mean that we don't hurt, but deep down inside there's a joy that nobody can rob from us. That's the fruit that the Holy Spirit is creating within us. And that's what he wants to see in our lives, lived out, because it can, it can transform a, a, a lost and a needy world. So the fig tree, the fig tree as a representation of Israel. And this becomes interesting here as we look back again at, at Bethany where he lodged. Bethany, Beth in Hebrew means house. So you have Bethlehem, the house of bread. Bethany means the house of figs. But he's left Bethany. He's on the way back to Jerusalem. And remember where he was earlier at Bethphage, which means the house of unripe figs. And so it's just kind of interesting to think about that. As I think that just the simple statement is, you guys need to be obedient and you're not bearing fruit unto the Lord and judgment is going to fall and did fall upon them as a result of that. Well, the disciples, they're like watching, you know, the miraculous in the physical realm take place. And it says in verse 20, and when the disciples saw it, they marveled saying, how did the fig tree wither away so soon? So Jesus answered and said to them, assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. That's potent, isn't it? I mean, we read that and we go, wow. That, that's a pretty, a pretty powerful promise there. But let's be careful to look at the indicators that are in here. Notice he said in verse 21, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith. If you have faith. Did the religious leaders have faith? Were they trusting in God? Or were they doing their own thing? They were doing their own thing. So to his disciples, which this is addressed to, if you have faith, and if you don't doubt, and notice in verse 22, whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you'll receive. Okay, it's, it's a trust in God. If you put your trust in me, I can do everything. And is that true? I mean, is there anything too hard for the Lord? Ah, oh, Lord God, thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thy great power. Nothing is too difficult for thee. Let me ask you this question. Can God do anything? Wait, it's a trick question. Can God do anything? <laughs> can God sin? No. Okay, so can God do anything? No. no, he can't sin. He can't lie. Okay, his very character is that his, his being is that he is holy. He is true. And so when it comes to the prayers of his people, the prayers that I believe God is going to answer are those prayers that are according to his will. If you have faith, if you believe, if you don't doubt. Let's look at a couple of scriptures just so we can get the whole tenor of scripture. Just so we don't get the wrong idea that this is a blanket promise that I've been really wanting a new F-150. You know what I mean? So it says right here. You know? But see, that's what people are doing with the word. It, uh, isn't it true? Again, you turn on Christian TV and that's what you're seeing out there. It says right here and they'll come zeroing into this one verse and they'll just make their point on it. And it, you have to look at the whole of scripture and see God is able. Amen. He is able and he can do the miraculous. He can do what we cannot do. But let's see what he's talking about doing and what he wants to do. If you have faith, if you don't doubt, if, if you pray, if you believe. In John 15, 7, 